Hello everyone, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to teachers, teacher trainers and researchers at the Farhangyan University in the third conference. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, share some of uh, my thoughts about action research uh, with all the participants. The title of my talk today is Empowering Teachers and Learners uh, Through Action Research. Um, I will start with uh, a quote by Peter Newmark. If you know him, he's an expert in translation. At the beginning of one of uh, his books, um, I think he says, uh, those who can write and those who cannot write, uh, translate, and those uh, who can neither write nor translate, uh, talk about translation. I juxtapose um, this quote from Peter Newmark um, to our profession, and I would say those uh, who, like you, are able to teach, and those who are not able to teach, like myself, uh, talk about teaching. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to share with you in the next um, 40, 45 minutes is uh, my understanding of uh, action research and how it um, can be used to empower both teachers and uh, learners. Um, so let's uh, move on. This is the outline of uh, my presentation. Uh, first, I will discuss uh, two key concepts, uh, theory and practice. And then um, I will uh, briefly talk about the implication of these two uh, key concepts for practice, in our case, teaching. And then um, I will uh, discuss action research uh, and its relationship with the uh, reflective teacher. And then I give you a couple of uh, action research samples uh, that um, other teachers have uh, carried out um, uh, to showcase uh, what I'm talking about. And uh, finally, I assign some learning tasks uh, to you, especially teachers, to design an action research of their own on one of the topics that I will be discussing. And then finally, we will round up. Um, of course, I have put uh, two videos in case that you would like to further know about uh, you know, action research. Okay, so the two key concepts uh, that uh, we are usually, uh, you know, engaged in in academia and in other areas uh, are theory versus uh, practice. Um, the conventional, traditional way of thinking about theory and practice is that usually uh, theory informs practice. So all those uh, who are engaged in uh, one sort of profession or another in the society, uh, usually they learn uh, what to do based on the theories related to their field. In our profession, the way that we act in our classrooms um, uh, is informed by theories about um, you know, teaching and learning, for example. Some examples of theory are uh, communicative competence or communicative language ability, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, um, uh, which, based on this theory of uh, language teaching, uh, then we have uh, uh, some implications for our practice in classrooms, and therefore we try to teach our students uh, in communicative way uh, by designing appropriate tasks and communicative, uh, you know, activities in the classroom. And so the basis for what we are doing in our classes in order to enhance the students. Uh, language learning through, uh, you know, uh, communicative uh, language teaching is based on the theory in, in the field. The other example of theory is complex dynamic system theory, which uh, has been disseminated by Lawson Freeman in the literature or CDSD. Um, and then the implication of this theory for classrooms is that uh, we need to conceive classrooms as a complex dynamic system. In other words, uh, a system which includes um, some components, and these components um, are not static, uh, rather dynamic, and it's very true. 
and they interact with each other. So the components include, uh, for example, the content, the teacher, the learner, the assessment system, the technology that we might be using in our classes, and all of these uh, you know, components um, interact with each other in a dynamic way. And when the classrooms are seen as a dynamic system, then uh, we will be able to define the role of each of the components and their interaction with others in a better way. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, make uh, uh, better, uh, you know, outcomes from what we are doing in the classes. The other theory that you might be familiar is pedagogical content knowledge or PCK, which is disseminated by Schulman. And so um, some teachers actually use this theoretical framework or perspective in order to uh, make complex concepts understandable to students. So the theory tells us uh, that if we want to act as a good teacher, we need to make uh, complex concepts uh, in plain, simple language so that our uh, students can understand them. And so any attempt on the part of the teachers uh, to make complex concepts uh, understandable uh, for students uh, through exemplification or the definition or practice or whatever uh, strategies and techniques they might use correspond to this uh, you know theoretical framework so these are some examples as how uh, some theoretical perspectives um, can translate into classroom pedagogy and how teachers uh, might uh, build uh, the teaching and instruction in the classroom based on some theoretical, you know, frameworks. Um, so um, this is again the conventional way that we look uh, at the relationship between uh, theory and practice. So basically, uh, researchers start uh, with uh, you know some problems and issues and uh, through a systematic approach towards research then they try to produce some knowledge um, this knowledge uh, provides a theoretical explanation or in a fully fledged uh, uh, you know type of research it might result a, into a theory uh, we have lots of uh, you know theoretical explanations or theories in different disciplines that are related to our profession. For example, those related to learning and assessment in psychology, those related to uh, you know, uh, learning again from a social perspective in you know, sociology, and uh, theories in education, theories even in you know, other disciplines that uh, have been developed by researchers in those uh, disciplines and therefore they have created a theoretical framework. These theoretical frameworks or what we refer to as knowledge then can be, uh, you know, uh, be used uh, in order to advise us uh, how to practice in our profession. In other words, I have called it practical wisdom. Uh, these knowledge bases or uh, these theoretical uh, frameworks actually result in uh, you know practical wisdom that can inform our practice. You can think about other, other profession and disciplines and it's more or less the same. So for example, uh, uh, general practitioners in medicine, uh, the way that they practice is based on uh, some wisdom that they have like, uh, got from, you know, theoretical knowledge, uh, you know, from their, their discipline, okay. The current view, so this is the past and conventional way of thinking about uh, the relationship between theory and practice, but the current view is that actually theory and practice uh, are reciprocal. Uh, in the sense that theory can inform practice, but also practice can inform theory. Uh, this is because of the affordances uh, that uh, teachers and other practitioners actually have in their profession and the daily problems, issues that they face, and therefore 
the knowledge that they can produce from uh, you know those challenges and problems and issues and therefore build uh, some theoretical perspectives um, so when we look at the relationship between theory and practice from this perspective then we are actually talking about empowering teachers through action research. By doing action research um, on the more down-to-earth uh, you know, uh, problems in the classroom, uh, teachers would be able uh, to inform uh, you know, theory and therefore teachers uh, become researchers as well. And they get the identity of a researcher and therefore able to contribute to theoretical explanations about uh, the teaching and learning in their own situation and as relates to their own classrooms. One important issue that we need actually to remember is that in most cases uh, some of these theories that have been developed uh, might not be relevant to a specific situation that we are teaching in our classrooms. So it might be uh, you know, a good idea to uh, uh, to to use uh, communicative language teaching, but in a particular classroom that I'm teaching in a particular situation, this might not be appreciated uh, by the students, my parents, and therefore they might have some more uh, you know demanding uh, issues that uh, we as teachers actually need to respond to. So. One of the problems when there is a unique uh, direction between theory and practice is that sometimes uh, teachers and other practitioners actually might find some of these theories alien to the situation that uh, they are in and they are working in and therefore uh, they need to handle their own problems and uh, you know challenges. Okay, so then we can actually reframe the previous slide in this way, that, not, uh, that um, as a teacher in the classroom, uh, and since we are facing with different issues and uh, challenges, therefore we can uh, start to conduct action research. And then the outcome of this action research could be some knowledge or theoretical explanation about the issues and the problems that we are facing in a particular context and therefore inform you know other teachers so we create wisdom for you know other teachers that might be teaching in a similar situation as us or even in other situations uh, that they might find the outcome of our research uh, uh, you know useful so as you can see uh, through identifying issues and problems, especially more down to earth uh, issues that we are dealing with uh, daily in our classrooms, we would be able to design action research and then based on the data analysis, we would be able to produce some knowledge in the form of uh, some theoretical explanation about the issues or challenges that we have been facing and therefore contributing to the body of knowledge uh, of, of the field. So looking at the relationship between theory and practice from this perspective would be an emancipatory or empowering way of uh, you know, enhancing the student's uh, um, teaching and uh, you know, practice. So since we have been focusing on action research, uh, it would be a good idea to have a look at the history and the idea of action research. The term action research was introduced by Kurt Lovin in about 70 years ago in 1948, uh, who described it as a cyclical or uh, cyclical process of four iterative uh, research stages. And these four cyclical iterative uh, stages were reflecting, reflecting on the issues and problems and then planning for action and then putting the plan into action, um, so acting and then based on the action observing the results and the outcome and again you know reflecting on that and see whether the intervention uh, or the plan worked or now 
not. Um, if worked, then it could be disseminated, uh, uh, making it available to other teachers. If not, what was the problem with it and how it could be, yeah, you know, modified? Um, so the, the central idea of action research is using action or intervention. We do some sort of intervention in a spiral of research cycles to develop, implement, and evaluate plans uh, for practice improvement as chemists actually, um, you know, clarified that. Okay, um, we need to understand that um, there are two perspectives on action research. Uh, we can actually label these two perspectives as broad perspective and narrow perspective. The broad perspective is participatory, emancipatory um, action research that is mostly used in sociological uh, research. In that, um, you know, some researchers would like to, um, uh, you know, enhance um, marginalized uh, groups uh, uh, in the society. So. Uh, Cohen and Mannion defined action research as a small scale intervention in functioning of real world and a close examination of the effects of such uh, you know, intervention. And uh, the main purpose was to empowering participants by involving them in the research and uh, making changes in their lives by making them aware about their rights and uh, how they might be able to, uh, you know, uh, voice uh, uh, their rights in, in the society. The one that we are more, uh, you know, concerned about is a more narrow perspective, and that relates to classroom-based uh, pedagogical action research, which according to Chemis and uh, McTaggart is uh, trying out ideas in practice as a means of improvement and as a means of increasing knowledge about the curriculum, teaching and, and learning. So basically, when we talk about action research in education more broadly and in second language, uh, teaching and learning, what we mean is that uh, as soon as you come across an idea as a teacher, a challenge, an issue, in your classroom, then it is possible to design a research in order to improve, uh, you know, your practice, but also to uh, create some knowledge and uh, theoretical explanation about curriculum, teaching and learning, and disseminate it through, uh, you know, journal articles, conference papers, or other means of, uh, you know, dissemination. So the definition of action research from the narrow perspective uh, is that it carries a general implication that teachers will be involved in research activities. So the core of action research is to involve teachers into you know, action research. And the dominant approach uh, to second language uh, teacher education emphasizes reflection as a tool for helping teachers to develop uh, context-specific uh, personal theories of second language writing. So you can see that the word theory actually here has been used uh, to uh, uh, you know, signify uh, it as a personal approach to you know, uh, language teaching uh, through, of course, uh, you know, conducting research and then producing some theoretical explanations and uh, that educators can facilitate uh, you know reflection by involving teachers uh, um, in action research okay now um, so we have already got actually enough about definition of action research so let's go to uh, stages in action research um, these are the main stages or steps in a cycle of action research. Um, so the first uh, step is problem identification through reflection. As we will see actually, there is a close relationship between action research and reflective teaching. So based on the reflection 
that uh, you appeared to use uh, based on your practice, it's possible to identify some issues, challenges, problems that you would like to address. And then based on these problems, you try to plan for action and then you put your plan into practice. And then uh, you collect some data through observation. Uh, this observation could be uh, you know, audio or video recording of what's going on based on the action that you have included in your classroom. It could be collecting data from the students um, through surveys and interviews. It could be any other means of you know, observation that will help us to collect some data about uh, the intervention that we have you know, made. And then based on the analysis of the data, uh, we would be able to reflect on the effectiveness, on the impact of the intervention that we have made uh, you know, in the uh, curriculum, in the teaching, in the learning, in the assessment. And then uh, either we can uh, disseminate uh, that idea, that action, intervention, if it uh, works, if not, we can uh, make further reflection and uh, modify the problem, and again go through the cycle of uh, you know action action research. Um, so these are the processes for uh, uh, designing and implementing an action research. It starts with identification of a problem, a challenge, an idea, through reflection, and then developing a plan for improvement by it's by reviewing the literature, this will help a lot always in the process of research. Once we identify an issue or a problem, it's a good idea to search in the literature and see what other researchers actually have talked about this issue or problem and what they have found. And then based on that, uh, we implement the plan and then we observe and document the effect of the plan by collecting appropriate data, as I mentioned. And then we reflect on the effects of the plan. And if needed, uh, we can uh, plan for further investigation and action. So a very coherent, uh, integrated uh, you know, cycle of planning and implementing uh, you know, action research. What are the theoretical underpinnings for action research? Um, uh, critical theory or transformative theory? because um, any action research actually will uh, result in some transformation or change in the practice and therefore critical theory or transformative theory is the underlying philosophical or theoretical you know, perspective uh, for this type of uh, you know, research. On the other hand, because one of the main purposes of action research is to emancipate or to empower participants, and therefore emancipatory theories and other underlying theory for you know, action research. By doing action research and by involving participants, which in our case would be teachers and students, then action research can emancipate uh, and help uh, you know, participants to understand and act on their situation. Well, some of the features of action research is that, as you uh, noticed, is that action research is interventionist in the sense that as a researcher and as a teacher, you need to intervene in the process of you know, teaching and learning. And therefore, action researchers intervene in the conventional situation to observe and uh, you know, reflect uh, um, on the intervention that they exert in the research site. Uh, so one of the features of action research is that it is interventionist. Uh, the other feature of action research is that it is reflective. And the other feature is that it's evaluative. It is reflective because any identification of the uh, uh, challenge issue problem uh, will be done through reflecting on our current you know, practice. And it is evaluative because um, ultimately, after collecting and analyzing data, we will be evaluating uh, to what extent the intervention was uh, you know, successful or not by collecting and analyzing you know, data. 
Another feature of action research is that it is situated, and this is very important, and it is context dependent. Um, so um, it inclines towards teacher and learner progress in a particular context rather than the, you know, theory building in that sense. Of course, it is possible to develop some theoretical explanations, but it is you know, context uh, uh, specific. Because as we know, and as uh, Douglas Brown, that I'm sure you're fam familiar with, has stated that um, every teacher is unique and every learner is unique and every teacher and learner relationship is unique. So any classroom actually is unique in the sense that it has its own you know, features and characteristics, depending on the teacher, depending on the learners, depending on the uh, you know, um, uh, curriculum, as well as uh, the inputs uh, that we have in the classroom. And therefore, um, action research in different contexts and situations could be different. However, uh, since there are similarities between classes and situations, there are some levels of, uh, you know, generalization as well. So how is action research different from conventional type of research? Those that, uh, for example, master's students or PhD students or uh, other researchers do, uh, is that an important difference uh, between these two types of research is that in action research, teachers do not have to follow all the principles and the steps involved in conventional research, because as uh, some of you already know, um, in conventional research, we need to do everything according to some standards and principles. The good thing about action research, because it is done at a smaller scale level, uh, we might ignore some of you know those uh, sophisticated and complicated uh, processes involved in, in conventional research. This does not mean, of course, that action research is not systematic. As we notice, actually, we need to go through you know, cycles and therefore it is systematic by its own. Uh, on the other hand, in action research, it is accepted that research questions should emerge from you know, teachers on immediate concerns and problems rather than from a review of the relevant literature. I mentioned a literature review in the previous slides, which is very helpful, but uh, the questions, the issues, the challenges that uh, uh, you know, underlie action research can emerge from you know, our practice in classrooms. Uh, in other words, research questions are more practically based and not theoretically uh, based. And this is one of the advantages of uh, you know, action research that addresses uh, practice-based uh, questions. On Benz, uh, who used to be our colleague actually at uh, Macquarie University, and uh, she then retired, uh, has written extensively on action research. Uh, in 2010, she has published a book. I think I have it in uh, my uh, small library. Uh, but I have uh, quoted uh, from one of her original writings, which summarized the features of action research to be contextual, uh, as we discuss it, to be a smaller scale, as we discuss it, and localized, as we discuss it. And it identifies and investigates problems within a specific uh, you know, situation. It is evaluative and reflective, and uh, it aims to bring about change and improvement in practice. It is participatory as it provides for collaborative investigation by teams of colleagues, practitioners, and researchers. And this is something that I did not refer to, but it's something worth uh, considering you might uh, design and uh, conduct action research in collaboration with your colleagues or even more experienced uh, you know, researchers. Um, and changes in practice are based on the collection of information or data which provides uh, the impetus uh, you know, for, for change. So these are some of the features of uh, you know, action research. One of the important things that uh, we need to highlight is the relationship between action research and reflective teacher, as I mentioned before, 
Action research and reflective teaching are intertwined. Um, in fact, we can say that a prerequisite for designing and implementing action research is uh, to be a reflective teacher because if you are not reflective on what you are doing in your classes with regard to a student's learning, assessment, curriculum, and other aspects of the classroom, then it is not possible to think about uh, challenges, problems, issues. So in order to be able to design and implement an action research, we need to be reflective and reflecting on all aspects uh, of uh, you know, uh, teaching and learning. Um, there might be several cycles of action research. As uh, we mentioned before, the action research starts from reflecting on issues related to the teaching and learning. Uh, so we identify a problem and issue, and then based on the problem or an issue, we plan a course of action. And then we put this course of action into action, and then we observe by collecting data and then look at the uh, outcome of the analysis and then make some reflections. Now, uh, based on the reflections, you might want actually to modify the problem or the issue and therefore enter into another phase of you know, action research. So based on the first cycle of action research, you revise your problem or issue. And then again, you do another planning uh, for another course of action and then uh, you collect data from uh, you know the research and then reflect on it and if needed again you might revise the problem further and enter into a third cycle of uh, you know action research so as you can see action research could be dynamic in the sense that it might not be confined to one cycle of action research but it could uh, you know lead to other cycles of uh, you know, action research. Sometimes even with one cycle of action research, we might come to uh, the optimal results and therefore that would be the time to disseminate the results. What sort of uh, research methodology can we use in order to conduct, uh, you know, action research? Uh, it is possible to use quantitative methods, qualitative methods or mixed methods. So action research lends itself a variety of research methods from these three uh, you know approaches to, to research depending on the situation depending on the issue and problem that you have identified <clears throat> and of course depending on the uh, level of investment that you are going to you know invest um, into into the action research now, this is the time uh, that I uh, provide some examples of action research. Uh, the first example that I'm going to provide is a novice teacher's action research on EFL learners speaking and anxiety. This action research was conducted by Mehiri uh, Kojak um, and was published in Procedure, Procedure in 2010. You, so you can see that the result of an action research has been published, which is very uh, you know encouraging and uh, it would be uh, very uh, interesting to see that um, the result of your action research is published um, in an outlet okay so what did uh, this researcher do the first thing was to identify a problem through reflection Based on the reflection, this researcher was able to identify students and anxiety with, with ex speaking as an issue, as a problem. The students and anxiety with speaking, the students were not ready to speak in class and they were anxious uh, when they wanted to speak. Uh, so she started doing some planning. Uh, the planning started with collecting some data from the students. Um, so she used open-ended questionnaires plus interviews to find the cause underlying uh, speaking and anxiety. And then based on this uh, data, uh, the researcher noticed that um, basically the students uh, are feared of failure. So they reveal that the main cause of their anxiety with their speaking is that they fear that they might not be successful in their speaking. So that was the main cause. 
Now that this researcher actually uh, got the underlying reason for why students have an anxiety with daily speaking, then she started a, a course of action, a plan for action. What did she do? She planned to have more informal speaking practice in the classroom and engage students in more informal type of you know, speaking to listen and to reduce uh, the level of anxiety on the part of the students. In addition, uh, uh, she prepared some vocabulary and grammar practice for the students to enhance uh, you know, their knowledge of language and therefore uh, to enhance their speaking indirectly. The next thing was to observe the effect of this action or intervention. Um, so she managed and arranged eight oral interviews with the students. And then based on the analysis of the interviews, the researcher reflected on that. So she found that the students found the activities useful. Um, <clears throat> and they felt uh, more comfortable when speaking. So we see this action actually worked. Um, and so she was able to write up uh, this action research in the form of an article that was published in Procedure in 2010. And you can see that all these, uh, you know, steps in the action research uh, were followed by this researcher, identified the problem through uh, open-ended questions and interview with the students, which and found that uh, there is an issue with the students, uh, you know, uh, speaking and anxiety. Then she planned a course of action, which was engaging the students into more informal speaking practice, as well as doing some vocabulary and grammar, uh, you know, exercises. And then uh, she put this uh, plan into action and then observed the results by interviewing uh, you know, students. And then she came to this understanding and reflection that the students found uh, the course of action useful and they felt more comfortable with the speaking. Okay, the next example of an action research is done by Dimor Gado in 2009. And the title of this action research is Extensive Reading, um, Students' Performance and Perception. This action research is published in the Reading Matrix, which is an online uh, journal uh, devoted to uh, you know, publishing studies related to, to reading. So this is an outlet that you might consider for an action research in case that uh, you do the action uh, research related to, you know, to reading. Let's see how the Mergado actually planned and implemented the action research. As we mentioned, the first step in action research is to identify an issue or a problem. Um, so the a challenge that she uh, identified was, uh, would reading comprehension be enhanced if extensive reading were used? So this teacher did not use extensive reading and then she thought about this challenge that, what if I add extensive reading into uh, you know, my curriculum and whether this uh, extensive reading uh, enhance, uh, uh, you know, a student's reading. So after identifying this challenge, uh, then the teacher started to plan. So she introduced extensive reading because we said that action research is intervention. Is therefore she intervened in the conventional, uh, you know, course of uh, teaching reading comprehension by adding extensive reading uh, to observe its effect on the students, you know, attitudes and performance. Um, so extensive reading was done at the beginning of the class on a fixed day, Thursdays for 45 minutes. Every Thursday, the teacher asked the students to uh, read a, for example, short story or something like that. And then she has started to observe by gathering quantitative as well as qualitative data. So you can see that this is an example of action research which use mixed methods by collecting both quantitative and qualitative data. And she used a test to detect changes in reading comprehension as well as a questionnaire 
to capture a student's perspectives and uh, you know, opinions. Based on the analysis of the quantitative and the qualitative data, the researcher was able to reflect that the extensive reading group did significantly better in the post-test than in the pre-test. And furthermore, the student's perception of extensive reading was very positive. So not only this teacher found that by adding extensive reading to a student's uh, conventional uh, you know, uh, curriculum of reading comprehension, the students improved their uh, you know, reading ability, but also through a survey study, she found that the students were very positive about uh, you know, this type of uh, intervention. So, this brings us to the end of uh, today's talk and uh, by giving you some potential topics for you know, action research in case that you would like to uh, try um, them in your classes. Of course, all of these need to be related to your own reflections in your own classrooms, but potentially these are some of you know, the topics that you might want to consider. For example, since I know that uh, some of you are engaged in teaching grammar to students, and we know that there are two ways of teaching grammar, one is deductive and the other one is inductive. So you might want to intervene and uh, find out whether uh, deductive or inductive would uh, be more effective in uh, helping the students to, to learn uh, you know, grammatical rules. The other topic is uh, related to a more socially oriented, you know, intervention, and that's uh, group work. Um, you, some of you might have already actually practicing, and I'm sure that most of you are doing, you know, group work in class. But my point is that you can actually uh, do that in the form of an action research uh, by introducing group work in your classes and then collecting data and analyzing it and showing that group work, for example, works in your class or not. Will a student presentation improve uh, the student's motivation to learn? So this is another potential topic that uh, lends itself to action research. Will teaching reading or writing strategies improve a student's reading or writing performance? How social media might be incorporated in language learning to improve a student's learning? So these are uh, some of the potential topics that uh, you can use action research and uh, the uh, cycles or steps and see and find out whether uh, you know, they have uh, any impact uh, in your classrooms or not. So let's to recap um, what I discussed today um, in plain simple language was that action research in its uh, broad sociological and uh, it's narrow sense pedagogical has very, uh, you know, potential uh, implication for practitioners and for teachers. Um, they can contribute to theory uh, by doing action research. In pedagogical sense, action research is used to make improvements in teaching, learning and assessment, or even in curriculum. Um, it is a classroom-based research and therefore it is conducted uh, following the five steps of uh, problem identification, planning, uh, designing instructional materials and collecting data and analyzing it, and uh, putting uh, plans into action, observing, collecting and analyzing data. Actually, this uh, belongs to this uh, you know, step. And reflecting whether the intervention worked or not or to what extent it worked and if needed, uh, you know, modifying the issue and the challenge and going through another cycle of, you know, action research. And these are the list of references that I cited in my, you know, presentation that you might find helpful. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope that um, you have found uh, this presentation uh, useful uh, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, listening. Uh, I'm sorry that there is no um, time for question and answer but um, you might want to 
discuss some of the questions that you have with other participants in the conference. All the best.